Well, we're continuing our series, as you can see, on the book of Revelation. And tonight's message is uh, in Philadelphia, the church in Philadelphia. We've been in chapter one where we got the vision of the glorified Jesus Christ. We looked at the words of revelation of Jesus Christ. And then we started this tour of Turkey, the seven churches. So we've been to Ephesus, we've been to where else? Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, and tonight it is Philadelphia. And the title for tonight's message is, It's More Than a Cheese, It's a Church. That'll help you remember it. Alistair says, try and get a catchy title because the time we put big butts in the Bible on, we get so many hits. <laughs> so it's more than a cheese, it's a church. So turn with me please to Revelation chapter 3 and verses 7 to 13, if you're not already there. Revelation 3 verses 7 to 13. So this is the words of the angel, uh, to, to the angel of the church in Philadelphia writes. And here we have what Jesus wants to say to them. These things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. I know your works. See, I've set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet, and to know that I have loved you. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world, to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write in him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God. And I will write in him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So here we are tonight in Philadelphia. Philadelphia, by the way, means brotherly love from two little Greek words put together, phileo, to love, and adelphos, which is brother, so put them together, and it literally means brotherly love, the city of brotherly love. And as regards its location, it was located about 38 miles southeast of Sardis, the church that we visited last week. In fact, it was on one of the major highways and apparently they got thousands and thousands of visitors every year. But Philadelphia was a dangerous place to live in because of the many earthquakes that it experienced. In fact, in 17 AD, it was literally flattened in an earthquake and had to be totally rebuilt along with Sardis and some of the other ones that we studied as well that were nearby but it was rebuilt after that so there was a lot of seismic activity in the area but Jesus sizes up the church there and this is what he says to us tonight you notice of the seven church of the seven letters that Jesus wrote to the seven churches there's only two really that didn't get words of rebuke and criticism do you remember the church at Smyrna Remember the church that was persecuted, it didn't receive any words of rebuke or criticism. And then again here in Philadelphia, our letter tonight we find there are no words of criticism to this church. You find in Philadelphia there was a small bunch of Christians who were faithful to the task. 
They were neither large in number, powerful or influential, but they were significant to Christ and he therefore took the time to write a letter to them. So tonight I want us to zoom in on verse 8. It starts by saying, See, I've set before you an open door and no one can shut it. Now, as you remember in our first chapter, I told you that the letters, or the, the book of Revelation is uh, to real churches. They actually existed, but they're also representative churches of the different eras of the church age, way back from the beginning up until now. And I told you they're also very relevant to us today. So we can learn from each one of those. Well, I want to zoom in here just on the fact that they are representative of historical periods of church history known as dispensations or time periods. For example, the church in Ephesus, it represented the church from Pentecost basically to the end of the first century. This is a church that had been in love but was in danger of losing its first love. And that was closely followed then we saw by the church in Smyrna. Smyrna we saw meant myrrh or bitter and that referred to the persecution that they were suffering. So the church of Smyrna was basically from uh, 100 AD through to 313 AD and that was a time when there were 10 major persecutions that I mentioned when I was looking at Smyrna from Nero through to Diocletian. 10 periods of, of, of persecution. Then that was followed by the church at Pergamos. Pergamos, remember, was a church that was wedded to the world. And this was literally representing the period from 314 through to 590. And this would have been the era of compromise and worldliness. Uh, of course, it's still going on today, but this was extremely marked by worldliness in the church. And then there was Thyatira. Thyatira was known as the Dark Ages and ran basically from 590 through to 1517. The Dark Ages when there was apostasy, false teaching, paganism abounded. Then that took us to the era of Sardis, which was really from 1517 through to the 1700s. And that was known as the time of corruption and reformation. It was a time when the church was really dead but woke up. Jesus, remember, said last week, it's time to wake up. Wake up, strengthen what remains. And we saw the reformation come out in that period. And then that brings us to Philadelphia. Philadelphia ran from the 1700s through the 90 to the 1900s. And that was the era of revival. So Philadelphia represents the era of revival. And that was followed then by Laodicea, which was from the 1900s through to where we find ourselves today. And sadly, that's the era of lukewarmness. And hopefully, God willing, we'll look at it next week. But we're in Philadelphia. And as I said, if you look at the corresponding era, that would be the era of revival. Remember our Ulster revival here in Northern Ireland was, what was it, 1859. And lovely revivals a lot around Europe and USA as well along that. And great missionary work was done during that period too. So the era of revival, that certainly fits in well with our verse tonight where Jesus says to them, see, I have set before you an open door and no one can shut it. So tonight I want us to take a closer look at some of the closed doors in the Bible because God specialises in opening doors. He opens doors from oppression. We're going to look at that first of all. And he opens doors for opportunity. He opens doors from oppression and he opens doors for opportunity. So let's look first of all at opening doors from oppression. For maybe some are listening tonight and you need some doors open from something that's trying to oppress you, whether it be mental, physical, whatever. So let's look at a few prison doors that God opened. It says in Acts chapter 5 and verse 19. 
says the high priest rose up and all they that were with him which is the sect of the Sadducees and were filled with indignation and laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison but the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth he opened the prison doors and brought them forth so Peter and the apostles remember had been preaching and healing in the name of Jesus they'd been arrested they'd been put in prison but here we see the release the doors of the prison were open but that wasn't the only time turn if you will in your Bibles to Acts chapter 12 tells us in verse 1 of Acts 12 now about that time Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church now remember he had arrested James the brother of John and had uh, successfully beheaded him and he seeks to improve his rating so to speak because the people seem to like this and they favoured him and so he, he wants to do the same thing to Peter as well so he has Peter arrested it says in verse 3 because he saw that this pleased the Jews he proceeded further to seize Peter also so Peter was imprisoned and he was sitting on death row so to speak awaiting his own execution he along with the other apostles remember we just read had mysteriously escaped from prison before so Herod certainly wasn't taking any chances this time and it tells us that he ordered a great high security to guard Peter verse 4 it says he was to deli they delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him if you're reading in the King James four quaternions of soldiers and a quaternion is four more so four times four means there's 16 soldiers to guard one person then verse 5 Peter therefore was kept in prison but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him then verse 6 and when Herod was about to bring him out that night Peter was sleeping bound with two chains between two soldiers and the guards before the door were keeping the prison now behold an angel of the Lord stood by him and a light shone in the prison and he struck Peter on the side and raised him up saying arise quickly and his chains fell off his hands then the angel said to him gird yourself and tie on your sandals and so he did and he said to him put on your garment and follow me so he went out and followed him and did not know what was done but the angel was real but thought he was seeing a vision when they were past the first and the second guard posts they came to the iron gate that leads to the city which opened to them of its own accord and they went out and went down one street and immediately the angel departed from him did you see the words it opened of its one accord the soldiers the chains the guards the guard posts the iron gates all these are nothing when God is with us and prayer is behind us and when you find yourself in a prison situation we need to know that God will move mountains if necessary to meet your needs you may know the story of Sundar Singh he was a Tibetan Christian who preached the gospel and he likewise had a miraculous escape from a prison type situation and one day he was preaching the gospel and he was arrested and as they did in those days they put him in a well and when they put him in the well they put the lid on top and securely locked it and he really knew what awaited him because he'd seen it happen to fellow believers and when he landed in the on the bottom of the well he landed on top of bones and decaying corpses who had been there before so the situation looked bleak but he tells his story so you know he survives he tells us that on the third night 
he heard someone unlock the lids of the well and remove the lids. And the voice says to him, hold on to the rope. And a rope was lowered right down to him. And when it got down to him, he noticed there was a loop on the end of the rope and he put his foot on the loop. And he says he was so grateful for that loop because he had already smashed and shattered one arm that he couldn't hold on with it. So with a foot in the loop and the other arm holding onto the rope, he was hoisted up to the very top. The lid was put back, it was locked. And while he got himself disentangled, he turned to say thank you to the person who'd rescued him to find nobody was there. Now what did he do? The next morning, he went back to the very spot where he was arrested and guess what he did? He preached the gospel again. Of course, news got to the official he was arrested, he was brought back to the official and uh, put on trial. And the official says, a full search must be made to see what has happened, who took the key. And when they found, they did the search, they couldn't find the key and he found it was still on his belt that he never took off. He tells that story. But folks, God doesn't just act in the book of Acts. God still acts today in people's lives and releases them from their prison. So whatever your prison, God can open doors. God can cause chains to fall off that would try to fetter you. He can make a way where there seems to be no way. He says in Isaiah 50, no, 40, 45 verse 2, he says, I will shatter the doors of bronze and cut through the iron bars. You see, nothing's too hard for our God. Turn over a few chapters to Acts 16. You're going to see another incident in a prison. What's happened here is in verse 19 of chapter 16, we see that a slave girl um, has been, who predicted the future, she had the spirit of divination. She'd been delivered by Paul and Silas. And it says, when her master saw that their hope of their gains was gone, she made money for them. They caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace onto the rulers and brought them to the magistrates saying, these men being Jews do exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe being Romans. And the multitude rose up together against them. And the magistrates rent their clothes and commanded to, to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. Who having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. Verse 25 says, And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been freed. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we're all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night, and washed their stripes, and was baptized, he and all his house, straightway. And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them, and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. Did you notice 
It was about midnight. The midnight hour that the earthquake shook the dungeon. The chains dropped from everyone's arms and legs. And the prison doors were opened. And maybe it seems like the midnight hour for you in whatever crisis you may be suffering. The suffering is intense. But God, but God, and but God says to you, he says, call on me in the day of trouble. Just like Paul did. He prayed, call on me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you. Psalm 50, verse 15. Call on me in the day of trouble. Remember, the psalmist, he also prayed. He says, set me free from my prison that I may praise your name. That was Psalm 142, verse 7. Set me free from my prison that I may praise your name. That was one of David's cave psalms. Tells us in the little inscription that he wrote it while he was in the cave. And David was in a real low state when he wrote it. In fact, listen to the anguish here in verse 3. He says, when my spirit was overwhelmed within me, you knew my path. In the way in which I walk, they've secretly set a snare for me. Look on my right hand and see, for there is no one who acknowledges me. Refuge has failed me. No one cares for my soul. I cried out to you, O Lord. I said, you're my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Attend to my cry. For I'm brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they're stronger than I. Bring my soul out of prison, that I may praise your name. Maybe you can relate to that tonight. In here we were singing that lovely song, Faithful One. I cry out to you again and again. I call out to you, Lord, again and again. And he is faithful. He is faithful. And he's able to open doors from oppression. So he opens doors from oppression, but he also opens doors for opportunity. I was thinking of 1 Corinthians 16 verse 9. It says, this is Paul speaking now, he says, for a great door and effectual is opened unto me, and there are many adversaries. Another version, there is a wide open door for a great work here, although many oppose me. And another, for a wide door of opportunity for effectual service has opened to me. There's great, and this is a great and promising one, and there are many adversaries. What a verse. A great and effectual door is open for me. And there are many adversaries. Now, in normal English grammar, we would normally say for a great and effective door has opened to me, but there are many adversaries. Here in the Greek it says, and there are many adversaries. You see, open doors and opposition, but the opposition is not meant to negate the opportunity. Too many focus on the opposition part that they lose the opportunity. You see what I'm trying to say? The word and simply acknowledges the realm of opposition. So let's just think of this simple sentence, a powerful statement by the Apostle Paul. He says, it's a great door. It's a great opportunity here. You know, there's a natural tendency to think that when God opens doors, that everything's going to go smoothly. If you're in the will of God, it's going to go smoothly. You're not going to have hardship. There's not going to be trouble. You're not going to know failure. People will say that. You'll know it's God's will. It'll all go nice and smoothly for you. But this verse actually indicates the opposite. It's true. You see, when a great and effective door is open, when the potential is there for a really great work to be used by God, there's not going to be a few. There's actually going to be many adversaries. But that shouldn't stop us. Think of Nehemiah. God granted him the opportunity to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. He granted him favour 
with the king. He even granted him the supplies. He shared his vision with the people and it really went well. They replied, let's start rebuilding. And so they began this great work. It tells you Nehemiah 2.18. People heard God's voice in Nehemiah's words and they said, let's go for it. Let's rise up with him and let's build. But verse 19 is equally important. There's the other side to this tension. It says when Simbalat, the Horonite, Tobiah, the Ammonite official, and Geshem, the Arab, heard about it, they mocked and ridiculed us. What's this you're doing? They asked. Are you rebelling against the king? So on the one hand, we have the people who are willing to follow God and do the work. But on the other hand, there's the persistent pressurization from the enemy, harassment. If you read further into chapter four, again, you hear the enemy's mocking voice and singing words of opposition. What are you feeble Jews doing? Will you restore the wall? Will you offer sacrifices? Will you finish in a day? Can you bring the stones back to life from these heaps of rubble, burned as they are? Tobiah the Ammonite, who was at the side, he said, what they're building, even if a fox climbs on it, it's going to break down their wall of stones. So here we see a great door for opportunity is opened and there are many adversaries. Now it's important that the Lord opens the door for you. The door is opened in the flesh, a door is created by man which were not ordained by God, will eventually close. But what's of God's will, will last. Remember, it was Gamaliel who said in Acts 5, he says, Now I say unto you, refrain from these men. Let them alone, for if this counsel or this work be of men, it will come to naught. But if it be of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest happily ye be found even to fight against God. So only what is of God will stand. We need to trust God to open doors for us. 2 Corinthians 2 and verse 12 says, Paul speaking, Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, a door was opened for me by the Lord. And do you remember Paul asked the, the Christians in Colossae to pray for him? It was in chapter 4. Verses 2 and 4. He says, Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving, with all praying also for us, that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I'm also in bonds, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. He prayed for a door of utterance to be opened for him. So, Revelation. Three verses. See or behold, I've set before you a door wide open which no one is able to shut. See it, behold it. Jesus told them to see that they had this open door. You know, sometimes God sets an open door before us, a door for evangelistic service, an opportunity in front of us, but we don't see it. We miss it. Famous quote from Alexander Graham Bell, the telephone man, the inventor of the telephone. He said, when one door closes, another opens. But we often look so long and so regretfully upon the closed door that we don't see the one that has opened for us. Paul wrote in Galatians 6.10, he says, as we have therefore opportunity, Let's do good. As we have opportunities, the opportunities come to us. You know, it's important that we go through the doors that open for us this year. You may already know the story of Duncan Campbell. He was a minister of the United Free Church in Scotland and instrumental in the Hebrides revival. It was on a Monday after Easter in 1952 he was actually in Northern Ireland he was in Bangor in a Presbyterian church 
at a faith mission convention. This was a big thing. And he was the guest speaker. But he was in prayer this particular night. It was the night before the end and he was to do the final, the finale, the closing uh, address. But the night before the end he was in prayer. And he just heard one word, burnery. Burnery. He knew it was a small island of Scotland, but he'd never been there. Didn't know anybody from there. He'd never received a letter from there. But he kept praying. And he heard the word burnery again. And he kept praying. And it came a third time. Burnery. And Duncan Campbell said to the uh, official that was with me, he says, look, I have to leave now. I have to go to Burnery. The Holy Spirit has spoken. And the man reminds him you're to speak the next night and so on. But he was adamant. The Holy Spirit has spoken. I had to go to Burnery. And he went to his hotel. He packed up his things. And he tried to get a connection to Burnery. He had to fly to, I think, Glasgow. Then he got a, fl a flight from Glasgow to Stornoway. And he ended up going to a fishing boat because there was no direct route. There was nowhere. Nobody went to this Burnery. He went on a fishing boat over to Burnery. And he arrived there and he saw a young lad at a key and he says to him, go and tell the minister that Duncan Campbell is here. And the young lad said, there's no minister on the island that's vacant at the moment. Both churches actually were vacant. He says, all right, go and tell the elder that Duncan Campbell is here. So the young lad flew over the fields and came to the elder and told him Duncan Campbell was here and he says I know he says I have the, the I have the room ready for him he's staying at his brothers I've it ready and I have the advertising done and he's preaching tonight at nine o'clock well how did that come about apparently three days uh, prior to that he was in his barn praying this elder he's in his barn praying praying for revival praying for God to pour out upon the land. In fact, God gave him a verse. It was, if I can find it here, but it was, it was in uh, Hosea. I think it was Hosea. Um, it was basically, can't find it now. <laughs> I've got this in there somewhere. Let's see. Uh, da -da -da. Where'd it go? Can't see it, but it was basically, he says, um, I will reign down as a Jew of Israel upon the lands. And the elders stood in this verse and he believed that revival was coming. And he believed that God would send, he was praying, send a man that will bring this revival in. His wife heard him in the house on three occasions, out in the barn, praying, Lord, send a man that will bring in this revival. And indeed, that's what happened. And it tells you, you know, great revival came to the island. A great door for the word of God to be opened and for God to pour out his Holy Spirit upon the people was opened simply because someone prevailed in prayer, simply because someone knew how to recognize the voice of the Holy Spirit and obey without question. And when that happens, there's no limits of what God can do. No limits. Verse 8, again, it says, I know your works. See, I've set before you an open door and no one can shut it. It says, for you have a little strength, have kept my word and have not denied my name. Notice the words little strength. This apparently refers, it refers to their size, to their numbers. They were small in number in Philadelphia. But you know, God can do a lot with a little. God can do a lot with a little. You know, think of the think of the lad's lunch. Remember Andrew? He scarred the crowd. And finally he found a little boy. And he said, here's a lad here who's five barley loaves and two small fishes. But how, how far can those go among so many? Jesus says, give me the loaves and the fish. And we know what happens. He gave thanks. He broke the loaves. He gave them. To the people, and if you read on, they gathered up the leftovers. Not only had they eaten till they were full, they gathered the leftovers as well. 
God can do a lot with a little. Think of Gideon's army. It started out, remember, with 32,000 troops who had answered the call to service. They had stepped forward, they had assembled to follow their general Gideon into battle. But the Lord says to Gideon, strange words, he says, the people who are with you are too many for me to give Midian into their hands, lest Israel become boastful, saying, my own power has delivered me. So now therefore come, proclaim in the hearing of the people, saying, whoever is afraid and trembling, let him return and depart to his house. And you know, if you read on, it tells you. So 22,000 people returned, leaving 10,000 remaining. I wonder what was going through Gideon's mind when that happened. 22,000 fearful people walked off who had already stepped forward. 10,000 left. Well, still it wasn't too bad. But then there was a second test, a second cut. And this basically eliminated the distracted. Remember, they were to go down to the water, see who lapped and so on. So the result of the second test, he trimmed the troops to 300. 300, that means that they were outnumbered 450 to 1 in strength. And yet still, they were victorious. You see, they were small in number by compar here in Philadelphia in comparison to the idolatrous people around them in the city. But small as they were, they were strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. You know, we can be too big for God to use, but we can't be too small. Too big for God to use, but we can't be too small. And this church in Philadelphia had the poverty of spirit to know that they really needed God's strength. And when you look at the revivals in the past, times when God opened doors, you find that the people that God used were very humble servants who knew they had little strength in their own but who called out to the Lord God Almighty. And God says that my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways then I will hear from heaven. I'll forgive their sins and I'll heal their lands. Folks, are we ready for revival? Are we like this little church in Philadelphia who hasn't a lot of strength, but has, to quote, kept my word and have not denied my name? In other words, there's a faithful few. They've kept my word and not denied my name. Now remember tonight, this letter is relevant to us. God still opens doors. Doors from every oppressive situation and doors for opportunity and evangelism. But the question is, can he find a faithful few? One of the verses I love is 2 Chronicles 16 and verse 9, where it says that the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of those whose heart is perfect towards him. He wants to show himself strong. But can he show himself strong in you tonight? He says, in this one I will look on him who is poor and of a contrite heart and trembles at my word, Isaiah 66 and verse two. A true revival is that divine moment when God bursts upon the scene and displays his glory, when he shows himself strong. It's a but God moment, really. You know, we began our Christian life with a but God moment. For it told us in Romans 5, it says, For scarcely for a righteous man would one die. 
Yeah, perhaps for a good one, someone might even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. But God, that's how we began the Christian life. And so we should live our Christian lives with a but God mentality. Remember Acts 7, it told us, he was, uh, Stephen was talking about the Old Testament patriarch. He says, because the patriarchs were jealous of Joseph, they sold him as a slave into Egypt, but God was with him and rescued him from all his troubles. Joseph knew, but God was with him. Paul says, I planted, Apollos is watered, but God gives the increase. But God. You know, we're good at putting buts into our situation. But we're small. But we have limited resources. But we have little power. Try putting a but God into the situation. Folks, he's the one who opens the doors. He'll open the doors from oppression, but God, there's no other way. He opens the doors for opportunity where he can show himself strong. Amen.